This is the frontier that I think most people have not gotten to yet is this is all made possible because of, of really corruption of government. For years, I used to tell people, write the FTC. I've met with people in the FTC. I used to exchange letters with them. I don't even bother anymore. These are, we're having a discussion that I swear I could not have had 10 years ago. It just wouldn't, it, nobody would ask these questions. It was just considered out of bounds. Robert, you're the expert in this industry. And in this video, I want to get beyond the basics. A lot of videos on multi-level marketing, they cover sort of, they do like a recap of the generic industry. But now I want to go deeper because as I've looked into multi-level marketing, I feel like the conversation needs to progress beyond the sort of uh, important, but also sort of over-discussed facts that, you know, people are losing their life savings. We know this. We know that they're, you know, a lot of these big companies have major, major problems, but I want to move beyond that and talk about how do we get further into regulation reform? And I know that touches on some very serious issues of like government corruption, regulatory capture, et cetera. Now, I think it's impossible to get into this without mentioning that you have a book coming out and it's called Ponzi-nomics for those of you who don't know. Uh, first, maybe I should say thank you for coming on the show uh, and then let's get into okay, this. Very welcome. Ponzi-nomics. Yeah, first of all, a, a made up term combining the term Ponzi, which is a, a form of fraud, robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, with economics. The idea here is to combine the two because in what we've got today is a uh, a belief system. And the belief system is a pseudo-economics portrayed in, the, in terms of sales, marketing, business language, multi-level marketing, which we'll get into itself, is a pseudo-economic term. You did in the book, you talked about the history of multi-level marketing, which not a lot of people know. I certainly didn't. I sort of thought, oh, Amway, oh, I've sort of heard of this thing called Neutralite, but I was really sort of surprised that Carl Renberg, who's most people think of as the founder of MLM, um, who he created Neutralite, which was the precursor to Amway, he was actually a massive failure in his business right. career. Like it, it was yeah. shocking. Like this is not a guy, it, we've lionized this person or Amway's lionized him. They put a statue up, they they wrote a biography for him. But this guy was kind of as as you point out, an abject failure. Can you speak a little to that? So I began the book speaking about Carl Renberg for that very purpose. I wanted to show the origins. Where, where did all this come from? And as you see, the, the, the origins are quite banal and mythologized. And in reality, they are quite banal. Um, just um, a small uh, sort of fortune seeker uh, guy uh, not uncommon in that era, uh, particularly, um, and uh, uh, and and ended up with a small vitamin company uh, in in the in the era when vitamin pills were just exploding into the market as a sort of new technology, and uh, he ends up uh, largely failing throughout a tiny little company uh, based in Southern California, never really moved out of that area. And in the end uh, is approached by two individuals who were also failures, failures. in their own, in their own careers. Yeah. I, you know, I don't say that disrespectfully, but they, they had not really achieved much in life. And, uh, but between the two of them, they uh, sitting in, in a, sort of temporary work in a munitions factory during the war and concocting a plan. And the plan was a, a, um, a variation. It, it included elements of sell, selling, direct selling, door-to-door -door selling, but it also incorporated elements of Ponzi, which had occurred only 20 years before, and the chain letter which had occurred only 10 years before, which was a mania in this country in the mid thirties during the depression, uh, where you would put money in an envelope, send it to a certain number of people and they would get it and send it to a certain number of other people, a classic chain. Yeah. At the end of the chain, the money flows up to you. And it was a, a folly, a mania, but it occurred in that era. So these things were all sort of combined into this distortion of direct selling 
in which the salesperson ultimately became the customer unwittingly and he redeemed himself and i'm using he here because at that time most of the salespeople were men that's all changed now um, they they would redeem their uh, position by recruiting other people and getting some of the money from the other people so there were elements of of abuse of salespeople in the direct selling business and the, one of these inventors was a manager who is for years had recruited salespeople never fully informing them of what they were up against Didn't what their costs yeah. and time and so on yeah. so that was that was not an uncommon practice uh, and as i say the incorporation of the ponzi and the chain letter into this to create what they called the plan so they purposely kept it vague and unidentified sure. the plan and when they implemented this plan at the end of 1945 that little company went from about two thousand dollars a month in total revenue which was cover all their cost into becoming rapidly a multi-million dollar business i mean How? in the course of several years just, just like a couple of years yes yeah and that and nothing about the company itself changed. So clearly no. it's the bit, something's going on obviously with the business model. And of course the business model was multi-level marketing. It was the invention of multi-level marketing and it sold the endless chain, the unlimited opportunity. You recruit just two and they recruit four and eight and 16. And pretty soon you have an army of people underneath you. And, um, and each one is making exactly the same promise to the ones below, no matter how far it extends. It pretends that saturation doesn't exist. It pretends that markets have no limits on them, that salespeople cannot uh, ha have over competition and so on. All the fundamentals that exist, it denies. So it was engaged in a, a large uh, process of re-education, diversion, of getting people to think about the possibilities rather than the simple realities of it. So from the from the beginning, it was always a sale of a of a a kind of snake oil, but not the vitamins. I mean, the vitamins really were more or less the bait and the trap. And uh, whether the vitamins worked or not, it didn't matter. They weren't FDA approved. Uh, they didn't have to be. Uh, and so that was really just the the mechanism for it since then we've seen a myriad of products the products really truly don't matter the, they are not what multi-level marketing is about the products are almost a pretense for the whole pyramid scheme i mean it seems to me it seems like almost an in-game currency like i don't know if you know in video games there's all these microtransactions that happen where you put in money and then they give you like this in-game currency, which is pretty much meaningless because it's just kind of like traded within the game itself. And then someone late, the company really cashes out at the top and they're the ones who make all the money. That's the way I think of multi-level marketing now, sort of a disguised pyramid scheme to just sort of get around the technicality. So whether it's vitamins or essential oils, it doesn't fundamentally matter that's your perspective as well that's your core argument isn't it precisely the product the products are merely just lures they are the uh, the cheese on the mouse trap and if you were to tell the the poor mouse uh only about the cheese and uh, and and talk to him about the quality of the cheese is it old cheese is it good cheese uh, what country did the cheese come from and so on? Uh, how does it taste without telling them that the cheese is set on a carefully designed lethal machine, a little device that will snap its neck. You wouldn't have helped the, the mouse at all. And that's what happens a lot is a lot of journalists talk about the cheese and uh, they get very involved in this. The essential oil really ch cure cancer and can, can they actually stop aging? Yeah with this cream and so on. And th this is the exact discussion that multi-level marketing promoters want to occur. <laughs> they don't of, want hey, to. your whole business is fraudulent. Yeah, instead of the whole business is not a business at all, it doesn't qualify as a business. Now, I would, I actually wanna to talk to you about this because I can tell, so you've been at this a long time and part of your book is sort of geared talking about I, I would characterize it as maybe your frustration with talking to journalists who always seem to grasp 
sort of a half truth, or if they grasp the whole truth, they don't print the whole truth, and they instead print uh, sort of like a watered down version, which includes a both sidesism of like, well, Robert Fitzpatrick says it's all fraudulent, but the DSA says it's not, which is like a glorified, it's a lobbying group owned by MLM. Um, but don't you think that's changed a little bit with the advent, whether it's because of the internet or people are waking up to this scheme and enough people have talked about it where now it's not that uncommon for people just popu popularly or in the media to be like MLM? Oh yeah, don't you mean a pyramid scheme? That's yes. penetrating more, isn't it? Absolutely, very much so. And having, again, we, as we began here, 22 years I've been watching this, I can <laughs> certainly recall when it was not like this. It was worse. If you said what we're saying right now, um, well, you you were considered almost um, possibly a conspiracy theorist, someone who has only a, a grudge or he has certain some kind of malevolent intention. Uh, you, you simply have a negative view of, of entrepreneurship. Maybe you're anti-capitalist, you're anti-business. Somehow you hate people who succeed and so on. So the, it was very difficult to say this, uh, and the media almost never uh, approached it. They uh, absorbed what was in the popular culture at that time. And that popular culture uh, got shaped uh, starting about 1980. This is another part of the history that people don't realize. Prior to 1980, and let's say going back to the 1960s, when the first, uh, when these multi-level marketing companies really began to make an, uh, an imprint in the country and hundreds of thousands of people started joining them and there were more of them. There began to be more than just Neutralite or Amway. There were more of them. At that point, regulators began receiving complaints, huge numbers of complaints and realized something was wrong here. And so at that point, laws were passed in many states, anti-pyramid scheme laws. We had no law prior to that. In addition, in Congress, 1973, a bill was proposed by quite a famous senator, uh, Senator Walter Mondale, that was to make pyramid selling a criminal offense, that is a felony. In some of the states, as in, it is in California right now, the law, the anti-endless chain law um, is the it treats it as a felony. It's a felony offense. Wow. So what, then that that law was passed in 1968. It was signed by Ronald Reagan, who was governor at that time. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that there was a clarity among within government and among regulators in the 60s and into the 70s that inherently any plan, any proposition based on the endless chain, that is. Uh, your your investment can be uh, you can gain a return on your investment only by getting more investors. They will right, have to do the you same. You recruit five, and they recruit five, and yeah. it always presupposes that everyone's going to make their money back because there's always more people. But obviously, that's a fallacy. Right. So this is an inherent, inherently deceptive. It's not just deceptive; it results in harm because the vast majority of people have to be at the end of that chain and they're going to lose. So it can cause loss on a, ma a large scale. They had also known that such schemes like this can create mass manias. So large numbers of people can sort of come under the spell of this and it can cause large societal harm, which we have seen in other countries such as Albania, where an entire co government was brought down by allowing one of the several of these schemes to run rampant. Right. So what happened? Well, what happened was politics uh, and primarily as I try to describe in my book uh, the in Ponzinomics book the player the major player here was the Amway Corporation and the two founders of Amway who had spent 10 years in the first multi-level marketing Neutralite they became extremely politically active one was the chairman of the US Chamber of Commerce and the other was uh, a treasurer for the 
National Republican Party. It was chief fundraiser for That's the Republican so Party. That's so unbelievable. That's Richard DeVos you're talking about. Yeah, and that, Jay Van Andel. Yeah. Now, it's then, worth noting that you guys all should know at home, who's our Secretary of Education right now? Yeah, you re- so. might recognize that last name, DeVos. Uh, it goes all the way to the tippity top. And that's what I mean by we have to go deeper in the conversation because if you only talk about Herbalife in isolation, you miss why the Federal Trade Commission would only fine them with a slap on the wrist instead of actually banning them altogether. When it should be illegal to be a pyramid scheme, that's what we say it is. But instead, they're found to have done pyramid scheme things and then we slap them on the wrist and say, don't do it again, when that's their whole business model. That's what I mean is that's what I want to see go in the pop culture. So give us a rundown, a brief history. You said it starts with Amway. Where did it go from there? So they realized they're about to get regulated out of existence. They had this huge case going up up against them. How did they get out of that? Yes. So certainly uh, circumstances sort of conspired to to do this too, because uh, they had some power. They had significant power already in Michigan, and they were uh, already a large company, multi-million dollar company, and there were several of them. But the law, the laws had been passed in various states against Endless Chain. The regulatory community recognized these things for what they were. These were glorified chain letters. They understood these things to be very harmful and de- inherently deceptive. So they, the government acted to shut them down, to literally kill multi-level marketing. I won't say in its infancy, but in, at, at, let's say in its teen years, because it had now begun to multiply into multiple companies, many more people are involved. And so they prosecuted them. The original prosecution would have been from the Department of Justice as a criminal offense, but that law didn't pass. It passed in the Senate, but failed in the House. Then it moved over to the Federal Trade Commission. Now, bear in mind, the Federal Trade Commission already now is a huge concession because the FTC does not bring any criminal charges. It cannot. It only deals in civil offense. So it treats it only as a uh, sort of a bad practice. And they even call it that, an unfair and deceptive business practice. So again, we had no law against pyramid schemes. So the FTC interpreted a pyramid scheme, a vague term, to be under the general category, unfair and deceptive trade practice. And they prosecuted the three largest ones at that time, uh, which was Coscott, Holiday Magic, and Amway. The first two were run by marginal characters. Uh, Holiday Magic was run by a member of the John Birch Society. He had run against Ronald Reagan in California. He was quite a radical uh, individual. Uh, And, his company was shut down. The other one uh, was uh, Glenn Turner, who was a kind of clownish character. Both are dead now. Uh, Turner died fairly recently. He had a cleft palate, which he used as a kind of brand for himself. Like if a poor boy from from South Carolina can can make it. And he he wore these gaudy clothes. He drove in big fancy Cadillacs and he built a so-called castle in Orlando, Florida. And so, and he was, both of them uh, also sold mind training programs uh, along with it. Those two were shut down, but when it got to Amway, Amway was quite different. Uh, Again, the two founders were heavily embedded in the most powerful political and financial organizations in the country. They portrayed themselves as very pious Christians. Uh, Actually, they were from a, a fairly extreme form of Dutch Calvinism in a little sect up in Michigan. And, um, and they tried to connect their scheme to capitalism itself, to entrepreneurship, to self-employment. And so it, it kind of rang well. It, it, it resonated with Republican politics, which were right. against labor unions and so on. So uh, when the government's prosecuting Amway, which they launched the case in 1974, uh, 74, 75, uh, an unusual event occurred. The president of the United States, Richard Nixon, resigns in disgrace because of Watergate, as we know. Mm-hmm. And his vice president takes over. 
Now, this is exactly during the time the Federal Trade Commission is prosecuting Amway and seeking to shut it down, as it had just shut down its two largest competitors. But the, the new president is Jerry Ford. Jerry Ford is a congressman from Lansing, Michigan. Oh, no. The, Amway happens to be his, among his largest financial backers. And so uh, they hold a private meeting. This is all documented in the news media at the time. They hold a private meeting with him in the White House while they're being prosecuted. By the government, they hold yeah. a, a private meeting with the president of the United States. Yes. And so uh, by this time, uh, by 1979, the other member of the two, DeVos at the Republican side, has become the main financial fundraiser for the new coming, incoming president, Ronald Reagan. So by 79, when the FTC renders its decision, effectively they drop the case against Amway. And the, uh, so Amway was legalized. And in so doing, multi-level marketing became, quote, legalized. And then from the next 12 years, which was eight years of the Reagan administration, four more years of his vice president, George H.W. Bush, there were no prosecutions. And during that time, they expanded into other countries and they solidified the narrative, the mythological narrative that multi-level marketing is actually direct selling. As opposed actually to a pyramid scheme. It's not, pyramid it's not selling. synonymous. Now, let so this is one of the things you talk about in your book where you say, Basically, Amway and this decision created sort of a this idea of almost a unicorn MLM, which is an MLM that's based on uh, actually not on recruitment, but actually has this element of retail sales that makes it different and, you know, sort of legal. And I think that's what people are imagining when they say, oh, no, this is like a legit MLM as opposed to a pyramid scheme. They say, yeah, this is actually based on sales. That's right. Rather than rather than recruitment, but your point is is show me the unicorn. Where does it exist? Has anyone right. seen one? What does this <laughs> right. look like? Like the yes. whole presumption of the Federal Trade Commission, their whole definition is sort of that. Oh well, there are these bad MLMs that are pyramid schemes, but then there's these good MLMs that are actually selling something to the broader public. Yeah. But as anyone who's ever uh, encountered an MLM knows, all their products you've never heard of before. You will not find them on the shelves of Walmart or HEB. Does anybody care in the Federal Trade Commission? Does anybody know that this is happening? Have you seen anybody actually push back against this? Because it seems so obvious when you do the most modest amount of research. Yeah, well, um, before I do that, I want to emphasize the idea that um, a, a scheme that had been treated as a felony offense only a few years before suddenly became the exemplary model of capitalism in America. That by 1982, Ronald Reagan spoke at an Amway conference as the president of the United States and called it capitalism in America. So really? this is an extraordinary, powerful government endorsement that imposed itself on public thinking. And when you have that kind of authority backing something, you can actually literally doubt your own thinking, not believe your own eyes because Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, they called it direct selling. They said it's it's the greatest example of American entrepreneurship. And they claim that people make money at this, even though I didn't. So this is where the imprint came on multi-level marketing in the popular mind. Even if you've never been to an MLM meeting, this is where, you know, you you got this idea because and and there was no really anyone else to speak of in the mid 80s a couple of books were written uh by people who had been in it uh one was called fake it till you make it by phil kearns and the other was called um 
Amway, the, the Cult of Free Enterprise. And it was written by uh, Stephen Butterfield. And they're remarkable books for de describing what goes on inside uh, these programs and how they work and so on. But they were lone voices. Um, so there was no lobby to tell the, to push the truth, but there's an enormous lobby to push the lie. And if you're a politician, and this is where I think it is so hard for people to grasp this uh, because it's so crass in a way, it's, it's, it's hard to understand this, that, to accept it, let's say. We can understand, but accept it. Politics is power. There's no power among the, all the hundreds of thousands of victims of multi-level marketing. Right. They're not organized. They have no spokesman. That's right. They have no political voice. Whereas the MLM industry has an, a lobby on K Street, a professional association. They hire the best lawyers. They have professional. They've used Nolan, uh, uh, what's it, Hill and Knowlton, the company that promoted the cigarette industry. So, I mean, they have this expertise in distraction and and so politics came in you know to play do the people inside the ftc to your question do they know i know they do know i know they know because i've talked to them wow but they keep their head down there's sure. no career advancement for speaking up against this um that at at the ftc agency level which remember is a small agency it really is is a tiny little agency. Um, they are funded. They are operate under the presidency, funded by Congress. So they're bounded. Uh, they're captured in effect. They are captured. And for years, I used to tell people, write the FTC. I've met with people in the FTC. I used to exchange letters with them. I don't even bother anymore. And they aren't even the appropriate agency anyway. If, if this uh, it's a criminal if, if, matter, you're saying it, it should be considered as fraud, pure and simple, and just let the law follow it from there. A, a fraud being a calculated deception that involving money that results in harm and is understood to cause harm by the people perpetrating. And that's really all we're looking at here. It's a kind of racket. And that's that's really what um, if people could get there. But, the, you know, the first thing is to break the prevailing narrative that it's business. That it's yes. Sales. Yes. I mean, and and what you have to do if you're going to understand that maybe the best way to do it is to strip away the fanfare, sort of all the well, what about this company? What about that one? And you identify first, it seems to me, well, what is a pyramid scheme? What's a, what makes a pyramid scheme a pyramid scheme? And, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I basically you have this endless chain, which we've talked about. Uh, you've got a pay to play system. So you have to buy in. You have to buy in to be a part of it to make money. And then you have a recruiting mandate where you're like, OK, I have to go get somebody to come bring them back into my scheme. And then you have this money transfer up. Right. Those are like the four elements that's, of a pyramid. That's scheme. the four elements. Yes. What is different for those of you at home in an MLM? It's every single one of those components and really nothing else. They try to harp on this, we're, we're retail sa selling. But if you've been in an MLM and I, it's almost something that, um, you know, you can't encourage people to go, go commit harm to themselves and their, you know, their family. But it's an amazing experience. At least I've been to some of the meetings. Because it's immediately apparent that nobody's interested in selling the product. So you, you don't even have to like think about this. If you just go to one of their little Hilton seminars, it's immediately apparent that nobody cares about, no one's excited about their, you know, uh, their cleaning solution. Everyone's excited about going out and recruiting. And so when you strip away, you know, the well, Amway's been around for 27 years. If you strip away the charismatic speakers, the prosperity gospel that underlies all of this. At the fundamental level, it's a pyramid scheme with a few little bells and whistles on it to try to hide it. Um, so I don't, so I think that's what has to be done is you have to strip away the smoke and the mirrors and realize that this is something that's been sort of, it's really, they've gotten away with sort of murder through the use of, 
politics and power and money. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole thing. Politics, power, money, and propaganda. And uh, that's another element to this is um, very sophisticated propaganda, which includes discrediting people like myself, making sure there are no professors at universities who would make a, an in-depth study of this. I've talked with people at universities and they would tell me, well, we can't get into that subject because, well, we have no funding. And if we were to develop a proposal for studying it, most likely the only people who would fund it would be the MLM companies, which would destroy our- Demand that they- <laughs> Yeah, so, so they just result. stay stay away, from, uh, you know, they stay out of the whole subject. So yes, I, I think it really requires people to sort of set aside the prevailing narrative to shift their language uh, away from uh, business and thinking of it as sales and business and just start from the premise, well, what is it? What actually is it? And and you already did that. You, if you just break that model down and what are the four elements of it, and those are the four elements. And as you said, if you set foot in one of these meetings, you discover immediately it isn't oh, yeah. about selling products. Also, the very idea that you would have a skincare or, or a lipstick or uh, leggings, clothing, kitchenware, that you could personally make a living from your home in the 21st century by yourself selling such commodity goods that are available in stores everywhere, online everywhere, you know, instantly it can be delivered to your house, no middleman. Why on God's earth would you need uh, a 10 layers of managers and in between and middlemen and salespeople. Why would you need a a personal salesperson? It's impossible. You might as well think you could make a living selling apples on the street, you know, and, and it's just a a ridiculous notion. Or even more so become wildly successful. They uh, unlimited wealth by selling your apples on the street. Like that's the, that's the real argument. Um, you know, one thing that I've been fascinated by, and it touches, it, it's an overlap between sort of what you and I sort of do. My kind of audience knows me more for these charlatans promising home-based businesses, is this idea of double think, which you get into in your book, which is uh, early on, the Neutralite founders had an issue where they were promising these miraculous cures to the, to, with their like whatever uh, vitamin they said it can cure cancer, whatever Alzheimer's, whatever it is. And then the the uh, was it FDA at FDA that time. comes up and they say, hey, you can't do that. Knock knock knock. We're going to shut you down. And they go, okay, we'll stop doing that. And they reworded the language to say it without saying it. And this is what I find all the time, where I'll see a sales letter that'll say, you know, this kind of mysterious drug that doctors don't want you to know about will cure you of Alzheimer's or whatever. This isn't even MLM. And then at the bottom, it'll say, well, the FDA hasn't been, you know, they'll, they'll say they're not making any claims while making all the claims. How does, how has this come about in multi-level marketing? What has, have they done to sort of say it without saying it in terms of their income claims and all of these things? Yeah. Uh, they have become sort of masters of language. Let's start with the term multi-level marketing itself, um, which was coined in the 1980s. So that era that I spoke about when the federal government and the state governments were passing laws banning pyramid selling and endless chains, that's what they called them, pyramid selling and endless chains. They had experience with Ponzi, they knew about chain letters, they knew about referral selling, you know, where uh, I sell it to you, but don't worry, you can get it free because after you give me two names and they buy, you know, I'll give you your money back. Well, how am I going to get two other people? Well, they can do the same, right? So nobody ever pays for it. It's always free. So th- this is the culture that multi-level marketing had come from. And uh, so the government understood that. This looks like flim flam, fraud. This is a scam, straight out. And they couldn't even imagine, actually, the early regulators, that this thing would ever endure because uh, they didn't understand that these people could silence victims with shame. 
they never imagined that these things would amass enough political power that they could cut off the regulators. But then in the, after they got this one ruling in 1979, and then they had an administration who basically shut down the FTC for the next 12 years on that subject, pyramids, they coined a new term, multi-level marketing. As I say, sounds like a business term, sounds kind of like franchising, direct to customer, B2B, something, you know, sounds professional. You're right, multi-level you know? marketing is very innocuous sounding, it sounds professional, it's very, it's, it, is sort of Orwellian in that It sense. is absolutely um, Orwellian. It was created exactly as an Orwellian term <laughs> to divert you from the reality that you're seeing and experiencing, but you're calling it multi-level marketing. And as you say that word, you're telling yourself it's a business. What you experienced was a scam, but you called the scam a business. So you can't actually... Uh, interpret that correctly in your brain the word level kind of sounds like oh yeah like a uh, national sales manager you up, regional promotions. yeah you, you move up with nobody gets promoted in multi-level marketing there are no you know competency communications no those levels are merely markers of your recruiting that's all they are yeah. and there are reward levels assigned to each of those levels but they have nothing to do you're not a manager, you don't manage, you're not responsible. There's no product flowing from one level to the next level. It all comes from the company. These and, are just markers. And fundamentally, it's almost a marker of how many body bags you're accumulating underneath you. Exactly. Because the vast majority, something like, I mean, it depends on exactly how you're running the math, but somewhere in the realm of 97 to 99% of these people. Every year. Every year are, yeah, so are, if, are dying if you, out. If you, calculated over a multiple year, remember that two or three or one percent, whatever it might be for the company, that's in a one year time frame. So that one or two percent, they stay the same. They, they're there the next year. Sure. The 97 percent are churning at a 50 to 80 percent. So it's a whole new crowd. So if you add up all the people who had been in it, let's say five years and say how many of them made a profit, now you're way, way less than In the 1%. point zero one, yeah. Yes. The final word I want to put in about multi-level marketing is the most important one, marketing. Yeah. MLMs do not market. We just said you can't know the brands. They don't advertise. Market means I have something, a good or a service, and I deliver it or provide the service to someone else. There is a market for my product, for my business. Mm. The people in multi-level marketing are the market. There is no external market being served by multi-level marketing, quote, salespeople. They buy, they have to buy, or they lose their position. The majority of the business of the company is generated by the purchases of the people inside the chain who are classified legally as contractors, buying at so-called wholesale price. So they are their own internal market. They make their own market. There is no market out there being served. So when right. you say multi-level marketing, you've kind of implied there's a business structure, kind of like a corporation. You've implied there are levels that kind of show levels of responsibility. And you've sort of implied that this is a system of delivering goods and services to some external market. None of that's true. Yeah, Not, if, if people can just imagine, because it's it's you kind of have to get to the point where you can look at MLMs for the weird, strange thing that they are, um, and stop seeing them as as a business altogether. If you imagine that Google, for example, giant corporation, the only reason way it made its money, no one used it on on the planet Earth except the people who worked for Google, except the software yeah. engineers. They're the only ones who paid the salaries. They, it's like it's like this strange thing of wait, so are they paying themselves? And you come to find out that they're not. The people at the bottom aren't making any money at all. In fact, they're losing money, and they're just end up paying the people at the top. You're like, well, this is insane. Which gets us sort of to the uh, the what you call the big lie of MLM. Can you explain what the big lie of MLM is? Uh, so the, the big lie is that it is a business. 
that it is uh, the two biggest lies are that it is direct selling, which is what we've been speaking about. When in which fact, is like when you sell it something door to door. Yeah, or, and people used to do this. Yeah. And there is a little bit of it still left in the world. Insurance salesmen still come to your house and sell the product. But you, as you know, you can now buy insurance online, all those Geico ads and, you know, uh, show you that you don't need the sales guy coming in the door anymore. Um, home improvement contractors come to your house and talk with you. Funerals are still <laughs> sort of sold this way, actually. Some some funeral directors still. But by and large, it's vanished. It doesn't really exist. It has no need to exist today, direct selling. Mm. And we don't need it anymore. There was time when communications were primitive. People lived in isolated areas. Uh, they were home. A salesman could show up. And, and provide a service and a product. It doesn't exist. So that's the first one. It is disguised as a business when it is not a business. And the second one is that it actually provides an income opportunity. So you've got a, a disguised business claiming to offer a broad-based business opportunity. In fact, it is advertised as the greatest in income opportunity in the world and that millions of people are making good money at it. And this is, I say this is a big lie because a big lie by definition is a lie so audacious <laughs> and, and, and that the average person could not believe someone would have the impudence, the arrogance, the audacity to say it unless it were true. And so sure. to, to take a model that we just described uh, that actually has no external market in which everybody's losing 90 some percent every yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that claims that you could in the 21st century sell commodity goods from your home and make a lot of money uh, these are absurdities that are perpetrated as reality and they are said so aggressively with such authority with the government at right over their shoulder saying it's all true it, it's, it's legitimate it's real and they have celebrities endorsing this you know, and they have sports stars and so on to where sure. the mind, as in all big lies, mm. can be overwhelmed and mm. you can create a mass delusion that defies logic where people can say, even when they lose, and this is the second level of deception. And I think anybody that explores, we, we're talking about it sort of, we said the first step, kind of the first step is is breaking free of the idea that it's a business, that it's direct selling business, mm. that it moves products and so on, that it's based on. But after you, that's that's sort of the lie, that's the delusion that all of us are left with, culturally imposed. It's being challenged today, I, for sure. But it has decades, it has been imposed history, decades right. into the public mind. Right. But what happens when you get in? So you sign up, your cousin, your friend, somebody invites you to it. You get into the meeting. You hear all this. You sign up. Within a month or two months, you realize, first, nobody's retailing these products. And actually, you can't. You see that plainly. You don't have to be a sales you know, business person to, to realize this. It, nobody needs these things. or they're high priced and besides they're in stores and and besides they're telling me on the one hand sell it and then on the other hand they're saying recruit but if i recruit my next door neighbor he becomes my competitor so it doesn't make sense so you conclude oh i'll get it it's not about selling it's not really direct it's recruiting that's where the business is yep so now you're in there you realize that much and then, of course, you're having to buy. You discover you have to meet a quota every month for you to stay qualified so that after I recruit you and two others and you recruit four others, I reap the rewards. But for me to reap those rewards, I have to maintain my own quota. So and I'm you're buying. You're not going to sell it. So you're just storing it like in it. your garage. You become the cut. That's where you become the customer, you're saying. I'm the customer. So, yeah. you know, uh, the, all of them will. It, tell you straight out, $100 a month of vitamins. What's wrong with that? Buy that. I mean, it's good for you. Well, you don't know if it is, but you they say. And then it keeps you qualified. And now 
you can start getting in on the rewards. So now you're paying, you're losing, you've realized it's not selling, and now you're losing. So it's not income. Why don't you quit? Right? Why don't why wouldn't I quit and rush out and tell my friends, whatever you do, don't get into this thing. It's I mean, it's not what it appears. It's the opposite of what it appears. Why don't they? I'll tell you why. I'll yeah. tell you why, because this okay. is something that I have a, such a gripe with, and it makes me so angry because I see it all the time. All of these things have this brainwashing, I would say, that occurs within the scheme, and it's a big part of it. I used to think it was incidental, but I think it's a core component of what makes these things successful, is they tell you that you're quitting because you are somehow less than or you're a failure. And that if only you had kept on, you could have manifested this. This is the whole positivity movement that is completely taken over all of these things. And I, like I said, I see it in sort of a parallel scam. It's, the, it's not as mature of an industry as multi-level marketing or as organized, but it's very similar where they tell these people, Oh yeah, well these are for this these results that we promised you at the beginning, these are for people who work hard. And maybe I mean, if you followed the plan, the plan works, maybe you're at fault. Maybe you're the problem. And there's this incredible amount of shame that goes on with these uh with with I know multi-level marketing, but all these kinds of schemes. Am, am I getting somewhere near the ballpark of of the yeah, problem? Absolutely. As you said, uh selling uh positive thinking as a, uh, an absolute tool for achieving success. That is telling you, well, you can be anything you want. The key to it is simply sh changing your mindset. Um, that in itself is, can be a business to go out and teach and preach that, you know? Yeah. And there are a lot of people doing that and telling you it's not about your training. It's not about the your number of people. There's yeah. competency or competition or, or the market or the state of the economy, where you live. Not about any of that. None of that matters. It's only about you. It's all up here. You can change it. If you can imagine it, you can make it happen. Okay. That's a business in itself, but in multi-level marketing, and, and many people call that a scam, by the way, but it's a kind of um, delusional story. It's hard to nail it down. There's always somebody that would say, yeah, that ha that's exactly the way it happened for me. I went through the course, it became transformed, and I, my life turned around. Mm -hmm. But in multi-level marketing, it takes that very powerful story that you just described involving shaming. Anybody can do it. If you can imagine it, you can make it happen. Prosperity thinking. And then they matched it up with an, absolute, uh, an actual proposition, an actual business. So it's one thing to sell it as a general idea. But they took it and said, now, there's your belief and here's the business. But the business is a calculated trap. It is impossible for more than a one or two percent a year to be profitable because they need a hundred others for them to be profitable. In other words, it's a money transfer, not an exchange of value. So if I introduced you into a room with no doors and said, just you know, you can get out, no, you can't because you're locked in. Okay, that's a trap. And that's what they've done. They've taken a belief system mm. and, and that you think how devious this is and how harmful this is. If I can convince you that everything's possible and if, if you should fail, it will only be your fault. You're, you're losing at the most, the greatest income opportunity in the world. Yeah. How Anybody dumb must I be it. if how I lost bad? the greatest yes. opportunity in the world? Wow. And you blew it. And you blew it, right? And it is only your fault because you believe anybody couldn't do this and you imagined your success and you had envisioned it. Mm -hmm. Well, they ex succeeded in two things. They shamed you when you leave, so you're not going to blow the whistle. But notice that in that process, you never did get out your calculator and go five times five times five. You stopped thinking. You stopped believing your own eyes, which were... They said it was direct selling when I walked in the door, but I saw within 10 minutes, it really wasn't. And they said that everybody could make money, but you know, actually I haven't met anybody personally that is making money 
we're all losing, but you actually suspend that judgment, those uh, judgment, you suspend your own observations, hmm. your own experience, and you substitute it with their imposed words, their authority. So they literally take your power away from you. They kind of enslave you. Is MLM, it, what you're describing is almost like some uh, religious, very religious aspects to the, the sort of the scheme. Now, would you personally call it, because I know you talk about this a little bit in your book, a cult? There's a cult-like thinking going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I just as we dissected the model to determine, is it a pyramid scheme? It's forgetting legalities for a minute. Just, you know, we understand what a pyramid scheme is, unsustainable, robbing Peter to pay Paul, money transfer. And you take multi-level marketing apart and it matches up precisely with the pyramid scheme. Now let's do the same with a cult. What are the elements of a cult? And, and they have been identified. I mean, there are people that spend their lives studying cults and there are these specific characteristics of a cult. And one of them is the utopian vision. Mm. Another is proprietary language that takes you out of your fact-based fact experiential language and puts you into this proprietary language using words like multi-level marketing, calling sales, calling recruiters salespeople, calling a money transfer a bonus plan and so on. So they use specialized language they use uh, a brainwashing technique of persuasion, which we already identified here, of separating you from objective reality. If you can imagine it, you can make it real. Nothing is actually real unless you say so. They separate you from your community. And so that if someone says, you know, I really think you have to take another look at this. I've investigated it. It looks like a scam. Uh, are you actually making money? Are you keeping a record of how much you're spending? They tell you, get away from that person. That's a negative thinker. The toxic person, cut them off. Cut them off. What, what you said, but that's that's my wife telling me that. You know, maybe How much that's is your wife the, worth? She's yeah, a loser. Much, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's what's holding you back. Maybe <laughs> that's what's holding you back. And then of course, they separate you from your own identity because they get you to imagine your dreams. They already know now that you've confessed in a way that you are a dissatisfied person. You're disappointed in your life. Hmm. You thought you had greater potential. You have longings for things that you've not achieved. They know that. So they will tell you, you know, the reason you haven't experienced these, these uh, longings, you haven't fulfilled yourself, it's you. It's the way you've been thinking. You say, well, I was brought up, yeah, well, you need to separate yourself from all that and, and learn from the masters how to think, how to be. And now we have things for you to read and, and study and watch. So then, and you need to be at these meetings. So they also dominate your time. So they have controlled your environment, separated you from your own identity, separated you from your community, given you a proprietary language to speak, and then also put you into this utopian thinking realm. And there are other elements to it. They mystify it. In other words, multi-level marketing, it has the secret to success. Well, I have a job, oh, I'm a school sure, teacher. Sure, you know, sure, that's sure. for losers. They come to this meeting, these people understand success. The that's know. it, right. they mystify it. So mystification, and then the separation of, your, from, of you from your identity, from your community, the imposition of a language. Mm. These are all the elements of brainwashing of a cult. Now, the problem people have when you say that is they say, well, it can't be a cult. A cult is a business. It can't be a business. I mean, cults deal in the occult. They deal in abstract, in metaphysical terms. But a business is so mundane. I mean, profit, loss, Cost, income. I mean, it, it's there's a, a ledger, you know, an accounting. It's the opposite of a cult. It, if anything, will will douse you with reality. It's a business. Mm -hmm. But multi-level marketing is not a business. 
First of all, the government allowed it to deal in the occult when it allowed it to perpetrate the delusion of an endless chain. That's an infinite, has infinite. You will not see Apple or Google speak about infinite. There are always limits. There are always limits of resources. Markets Market have realities, limits. Yeah. Multi-level marketing is the only so-called industry allowed to do that. So they have already been allowed to traffic in the occult and which is or metaphysical, mystical terms, delusional, unreal. Also, also, I've got to, I've got to say, I think it's important to n notice this, this, uh, this believe it, you will do it. While I, I, I think in an extremely limited scope, I, everyone can understand, you know, you've got to be confident and stuff like that, but they push it far beyond that. It's very much wrapped up in Napoleon Hill in this Christian science, you know, you, you you're only limited by your beliefs, all this kind of stuff. You re re really quickly are heading towards religious language, religious territory, aren't you? Absolutely. You're, you're engaged. You're, you, and that's why when you go to most companies, they put a lid on that. They, they may engage in a bit of it of trying to get you to bolster your confidence, you know, have, have a vision, set goals for yourself, have a plan. And, and, and take responsibility for your own life and so on. But, but they will not push it throughout your whole life. They don't try to impose it and make it a way of life for you. In multi-level marketing, not only do they push it to the total, there are no limits. They will start talking to you about your marriage, your family life, your child rearing, your religious practices, uh, what you do with your time, your, what do you watch on television, they will, it becomes a way of life, but then most important, and I think this is where it really crosses this line, they then attach it to a specific business proposition of the, of the multi-level marketing business. Here's $500 you, you pay, you do, now, now you're saying, I can, you can do all these things I told you you can do, you can make success, but they just gave you a plan that it is mathematically, physically impossible for any but just a tiny percent to succeed at. So you, right. absolutely it is a cult, absolutely it is engaged in brainwashing. And by the way, they've been doing this for over 40 years. The first MLMs, both, all three, Amway, Cascot, Holiday Magic had very sophisticated uh, re-education programs, mind training programs. So it's always been hooked up with that. It's a necessary component because as I say, if they didn't do that and within a day or two, most people would probably figure it out. This is not working. This is not what they said it was. Right. And not only am I quitting, I'm warning others. So the, the a flim flam uh, or a scam has always two elements. One is to get your money. The second is to make sure you don't go to the police. And so not only in multi-level marketing, which is done now on an industrial scale, they already took care of the police. Police are in their pocket. What they're worried about is public awareness. And that's why I say, I think, as we said, there is a shift occurring not because there's regulations. No, there, there certainly is not, yeah. <laughs> no, but because public awareness is growing. People are breaking the silence. They're not afraid anymore. And you look on the internet now, and, and this podcast you're doing right here is evidence of it. These are, we're having a discussion that I swear I could not have had 10 years ago. Like, it just wouldn't, it, nobody would ask these questions. It was just considered out of bounds. You could say some MLMs are pyramid schemes. Yes. Well, tell me which ones and how do I know the difference? Right. And nobody could do that. But if you said all of them are essentially the same, you were considered out, out of bounds. You could never call them a cult. You could say they were cult-like maybe, some of them. But you couldn't really get bore into that subject and say, this looks an awful lot like brainwashing, undue influence, overwhelming critical thinking, abusing people's minds, really. You couldn't say such things. And finally, and this is the frontier that I think most people have not gotten to yet, is 
this is all made possible because of, of really corruption of government. It, it and that's the, that's the topic where I think most of us are, if not just hopeless, we're almost perplexed too, because it's incredibly complicated of, okay, the government's corrupt. What does that mean? Who's corrupt? Yes. There has to be people. This is, you're sort of blaming a systemic structure, but that in of itself isn't super productive. How do you get to meaningful reform? How do you get to meaningful change as an individual who's sort of talking about it? Um, do you have any answers to that? Surely you've thought of quite a lot about that. Oh, God, yes. Um, as I said, I, I've been to Washington. I've met with people at the FTC. I've met with a few members of Congress. Um, and, you know, recently one hedge fund tried to bring down one large company, uh, Herbalife, yeah. and they expended quite a bit of money trying to find out who in the government. They believed the FTC would be persuaded by the facts, and so they spent $50 million dollars gathering those facts, publicizing those facts, didn't work. You're, of course, talking about Bill Ackman's very public fight with Herbalife. And yeah, he had a hard lesson in learning that facts don't necessarily matter when you're talking about an industry that has essentially cornered the market on their own regulation. Right. Um, it, it, it feels like we're in a time where the only meaningful change you can get out of the government, even with a perfect exposure of a business, is an individual MLM being labeled. Oh, we found out that that was a, oh, silly us. That was a pyramid scheme all along. You know, how could we have let that occur? We're shutting that down. And there's no looking at the entire, you know, sea of other MLMs. There's no thought that, hey, maybe all of these business models are based on the exact same business model back from Neutralite which was already ruled against way back in the day. Maybe this is just the same thing over and over again. Let's do something about that. That's my personal frustration with this is the um, sort of microscopic view that's been taken is we're just going to prosecute individuals. Right. Yes. And that, I, I think I diverted us a little bit. You had brought up this, this idea of unicorn. And, and I used that in the book because what the FTC has done as the complaints rose mm. and they couldn't get away with just saying it's legitimate direct selling, there was just too much evidence piling up. So they created a, a theoretical model here. Under the theory, multi-level marketing uh, is workable, legitimate business. And, and so it has all the same elements you identified, yet somehow the people in it earn sustainable profit from retailing. Yes, and the that, company earns its revenue not from the distributor, so-called, but from an external market that's buying those products. Why they're buying them, nobody knows. How you could manage to retail the product under these conditions, they don't answer that. But they say, but if it did, it would be legitimate because the law uh, isn't really, hasn't spoken directly about endless chains. We don't have an anti-endless chain federal law. So we'll set that aside and we'll just say if more of the money came from outside the chain than inside the chain and so on, and if people weren't being harmed because they were actually able to sell the product profitably, uh, you know, it would be legitimate. And you say, okay, in theory, in theory, pigs could fly. You know, in, in never theory, seen one, but okay. In, yes, yeah. in theory, I won't ever die if I just think positively. In, in theory, okay. But give me some evidence now. Show me one. Just give me one example. One, you know, uh, company, the Paragon, the one that's representative of this model. They've never given one. They've never given one. They've never. I, they've never tracked retail sales. You're saying. No, they, they deliberately do not go and look. So they don't find one company and say, there it is. All the people in there are retailing. They're not just having to buy the product themselves. There's an external market out there. There's people making money every day, just selling the product from their homes, like, like in days of old, and happy customers and happy salespeople. 
and you say, well, what about all that other, the bonus, the recruiting? Well, yeah, that's there, but it isn't, uh, it, it doesn't characterize the company. I said, well, okay, which one would that be? Show me one, because I can't see how you could offer people unlimited income by recruiting and they somehow don't avail themselves of it. Instead, they go out and sell in effect, apples on the street to their neighbors and friends, and they actually are able to keep doing that. And the friends keep buying these apples from them rather than going to a grocery store. Show me one. It kind of doesn't make sense. They never do. So the theory is just a ploy. It's an agency ploy to avoid the terrible reality. Well, I, yeah, and the terrible reality can be seen or it you you sort of sense the scale of it when you see Reagan, Clinton, Bush, all involved with multi-level marketing. These are not some low-level, uh, you know, state senator. It's not a federal. It's not a, a you know a House of Representatives person. It's not even a lobbyist. These are presidents that are representing these private companies and essentially almost lobbying on their behalf. Cause of course, if Clinton thinks it's great, if Bush thinks it's great, well, this is just a bipartisan issue. We all think it's great. That is to me, what's the most, uh, disillusioning about it where you see disillusioning. Yes, yeah, that's you, it. Because, um, what you see is that, um, the politicians have used, um, and, and I've, I've tried to write about this again, put in historical times. 1970s is actually now economists show us was the high point of the middle class and it's been going down 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 ever since from the 70s on the small towns collapsed the deindustrialization the factories closed the downsizing the outsourcing the employment flatlined you know the income pay wage levels flatlined costs kept going up Healthcare became unaffordable. College became unaffordable. Home ownership became unaffordable for large numbers of people. And literally, age expectancy, life expectancy has, is flattened or is going down in the U.S. So something terrible has sort of been happening in the U.S. Our government, and I'm not speaking about polit politicians of one party or another, but this was a huge huge trends occurring. They didn't actually do anything about any of this. They let payday loans come in and charge a thousand percent interest. They let private schools come in and charge, you know, students coming out with a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand of debt. People die because they can't get health care. They didn't deal with those. Multi-level marketing helped them by saying the American dream isn't dead. It's alive and well. It's mm -hmm. better than ever. It's a new thing. It's called multi-level marketing and it's all up to you. Don't come and complain. It's all about, it's a wonderful story that serves as a wonderful cover for negligent or corrupting politicians. And they allowed that. It was very convenient. On the other side, the public who were victimized by this had no voice. They didn't come forward in throngs. They didn't drive up there in their tractors. They didn't carry signs. They were silenced, shamed in the silence. They were seething. Some of them committed suicide. I mean, I can't tell you in my work how many divorces I, I've seen occur from people in these things. Young people dropping out of college. Uh, families just ripped to pieces on this. Their lives have been really torn up by this delusional story that was perpetrated and spread like a virus here, but it served politically. It was very convenient for both parties who were essentially doing nothing about those broad trends that I described that have driven down the quality of life in America and other countries too. To such an extent that in some countries when MLM enters, the people are led to believe this is the epitome of capitalism. This is the free market. This is what it looks like. Sure. And I mean, how ridiculous is that? That a pyramid scheme comes in representing 
um, market economies. It's, it's, just, it's just such a travesty. And I think we will ultimately look back on this as one of the great follies and tragedies of our time that well, I the think government we'll look back at it like a Ponzi scheme. I mean, how did anyone ever push this or allow this to be pushed? Or who was falling for why? And I think, you know, these I do think it will eventually become illegal. I think I think you only get a bigger body count as you go. There's no evidence. So you can do the smoke, the fanfare, but eventually people are going to get it. You do see the public backlash growing. You see Google outright banning advertising pyramid scheme. They, they outright say it, you know, yes. uh, where the main purpose is recruiting. I mean, so there is a backlash that's not even in the government realm. And maybe that will eventually be enough to put pressure and also awareness about these problems out there to where even your layman um, kind of knows it's in the zeitgeist as you said yes it is in the zeitgeist but i don't i didn't in the book i don't know if you got to the end there but i didn't raise hope for reform from the government because i can't myself right now name a single member of congress speaking out about this i can't and um so far we there's not been a single book published on this subject mm -hmm nor a one, not even one comprehensive documentary produced on the subject. So the truth is still muzzled quite a bit, sure. but as you said, the voices are growing, they're bolder, they're younger, and they're using tools like this, podcasts, video channels, and so on, that are very powerful. And they don't need a publisher, uh, you know, uh, to tell them whether they can censor it or not. Yeah. And they, so I, I, it is spreading. And when it gets to some critical point, some tipping point, then you'll probably see some politicians getting on board. That's no, I think you're right. I think there will be a tipping point. And let me tell you, um, I think you hit on a key point there, which is that a lot of these things are muzzled when enough power gets together, MLMs find a way to capture it, right? And they find a way to make it just enough, inconvenient enough. And this happens with all sorts of schemes. I mean, let me tell you, I had a, I won't say who, but I had a pretty large production company come to me wanting to document what I talk about as this big kind of new scam, especially during COVID. There's this rise of scams going on. And we were two days before shooting and they sent me a message saying, hey, we love what you do. We think it's important, but... It's too much of a legal liability. We're scared. We don't want to put it out there. And I think that's been a lot of the cause for silence for so long is that the only methods of communication were these big companies. And a big company doesn't want to tango with another big company in a drawn out lawsuit. I guess what makes me optimistic is increasingly there's media channels that are not constrained by standard protocol. It's harder and harder. I, I know this I know this kid, I was just talking to him. He did an investigation. He went into World, World Financial Global and he brought in a pin camera, right? And he made this big like video about it. And when he put it out immediately, he got a he got a cease and desist letter from World Financial Global. And his response was, okay, sue me. <laughs> and it's just like you could never have imagined that happening with NBC putting out something like that. They never would. They never would do something like that. It's too risky. It's too much of a liability. And so uh, that brings hope to me. And I think you have to give people hope. I think it's a curse of the human psyche. We have to have some level of hope. Um, otherwise, it becomes too convenient to just not pay attention. I think if you don't have hope, then it's, well, why am I even bothering? You know? Yeah, well... I, I have, uh, in my own work, and I said this in the book, I because remember, you said you asked me the first question you asked, how long have you been doing this? 22 years. 20, 22 years. You, can, you, can you endure 22 years without hope? I've been sued. I was involved in a large lawsuit. One of these uh, harassing lawsuits went on for five years. Wow. And, um, and I've watched website after website go down under these threats in the past. I've seen so many people just back out of speaking, whistleblowing, 
um, under the pressure. And, and yet, uh, what I have observed uh, tracing this over time and being a part of it, it, it never stopped. People kept pushing forward. They kept, they, you know, they kept going on. And I think the, the, the truth of multi-level marketing, the, the real truth, is so compelling and the, the 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 trend here the phenomenon is so large so important it, it will not endure it can't hold you know it can't hold everybody down it can't keep these voices down so people are speaking people will keep speaking i've kept speaking but not because i could see some end point because after 22 years you you, you stop looking for an end point you you just sure. you just mark sure, it. Sure, sure. You just mark your your days and your months as they go along. Right. As long as you know you're grounded, there are people getting it. There are people growing. That there you see some change occurring, which I have certainly observed, and and that's where you you gain your your strength. Um, but you don't get it really. I don't think people that have been in it for a long time have hel have held on to a hope. It's just they couldn't see anything, you know, you, you just couldn't see anything. And uh, sometimes, you know, we, we look right now, you mentioned Bush, uh, I mentioned uh, oh, Reagan God. and yeah. so on. It went on. But we now the current president of the United States was the chief, most famous endorser and promoter of multi-level marketing for 10 years. It's a great for point, 10, Robert. For 10 great years. Point. So you know it's it's not that they influence the white house they're in the white house they're the king of the white house i know i know uh they're no, seated no. To... yeah you're it's a... there i mean and i and and it is not partisan anymore it is a bipartisan thing the the maybe trump was the biggest domestic in, endorser but who was the greatest international endorser madeline albright yeah, right, sure. Madeleine yeah. Albright. Yeah. She was Bill Clinton's Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. She's a revered figure in the Democratic Party. See, it's not partisan. It's not partisan because neither party has been addressing the fundamental issues that multi-level marketing exploits. And multi-level marketing not only exploits that, but gives cover to the political uh, operatives who are really negligent, ignoring people's lives and instead they've offered them this concoction of here yeah. drink this yeah. you know kool-aid here drink this kool-aid you'll feel better and people do feel better for just a little while <laughs> i i think it's important to, to just recap here um MLMs, again, this has to be my, I've gotten through probably two thirds of the book to answer your earlier point. But um, my favorite realization though was this thing was built on essentially a con man who was looking to make a fortune. He was already lying about his vitamins, all this kind of stuff. He had watched as these other con men were kind of making their fortunes and stuff. and. That is sort of the, the, the dirt in which MLM sprouted or pyramid selling, if we could refer to it as, as its first name. That tells you most of what you need to know. Nothing's really substantially changed. The only thing that's changed is the political kind of power these people are wielding. And when you understand that, you can see it sort of for what it is which is a long deception that's mostly happening in our government because nothing's really changed with the MLM formula. It's as it always was. And so that's, that's, that's ultimately what I'd like to see, even just even maybe if you are uh, politically sort of nihilistic about, about the outcome, I think we can return to that public place. And so I want to thank you for making a huge contribution to this to this effort because I'm sure you hear it all the time, but I think you've done an incredible service to so many people who are trapped in this this loop. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for the acknowledgement. Um, uh, it is it is. Uh, it, I'm very happy that you've taken an interest in it too and made it part of your work. 
and others have as well. So, yeah, I think I think there are many positive things to to see uh, that are occurring here, and hopefully, my book, the the concept of Ponzinomics, you know, Ponzinomics, it, it is stated at the very beginning as a as a def in the context of a definition, and the last part of the definition says that a delusion like this can never endure without state or government Collusion. support. Yeah, it has to be there. Otherwise, the the sheer experience of it, and the awareness of of the public would cause it to collapse. But if if it has enough authority behind it to to back it up and hold it up, mm. it can endure for a very long time, as as we have seen. But when enough public of the public really pierces it, demystifies it, recognizes it as cultic. And understands the elements of it that it's not a business you know it's pulling the curtains back and you see the little guy with the smoke machine and the levers and making the sounds and that's it and then it's over yeah well guys um please go get yourself a copy because i can't recommend this book enough not it, for nothing else the amount of historical digging and collecting you've done here i think you deserve you know, a round of applause. Cause I've never seen, I don't think anything like this exists as you point out. I mean, no, it doesn't. Um, so if you're, if you have any interest in multi-level marketing, I know we have the business of the 21st century, Robert Kiyosaki, this should be the companion piece to that Ponzinomics by Robert Fitzpatrick. Um, when is it coming out? Well, by the end of the year. And, uh, okay. that's another part of the story is, uh, you know, publishers are frightened of this thing, but fortunately really? we do have, yeah, they really are just like your experience with a yeah, unnamed fair enough. major. Fair yes, enough. Yeah, that's a yeah, great point. Publishers are just like that for the same reasons, <laughs> Yeah, but you know, we don't need them. So the, the book will be out, uh, and in both hardback and ebook by the end of the year. Okay. And uh, yeah, so when um, you publish it, I will include a link in the description. Just send me an email. To let me know it's out. So if you're watching this in the future, because I know that's, uh, you know, that's the magic of YouTube. If you're watching this in the future and you can look below the fold in the description, uh, there will be a link for very soon. So thank you, Robert, for coming on the show, sharing your 22 years of wisdom about multi-level marketing and exploring the depths because I wanted to get beyond the normal, the normal pale of what is multi-level marketing? Is it a is it a pyramid scheme? So I think yeah. we really got to do that today, and uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks. Great. Bye bye now. <laughs>